James has written a great article in the New Yorker about uh, Larry McCarthy, who is the uh, sort of ultimate bad boy of negative advertising. Um, uh, and of course, was someone who did the, as you pointed out, the uh, Willie Horton ad in 1988. Um, he's had a few in this cycle. Is there one particular, maybe, is he Exploding well, Suitcases, you, you right? showed one, the Exploding yeah, Suitcases right. one, yeah. Um, and he's, he, I mean, the themes that he's been hammering on are uh, baggage for Newt Gingrich, and uh, that both Gingrich and Santorum are Washington insiders who can't fix the problems the way an outsider like Romney can. So, I mean, I th you know, when you look at the continuum of these ads, you begin to think, oh, God, nothing ever changes in American politics. It's unbelievable how the arguments are exactly the same. But, um, but um, in a way, I think when I looked at those ads of the, of the, the Daisy ad in particular and some of those uh, the early ones, they were in some ways more inventive then. I, I mean, one of the things about McCarthy's ad, though he's, he's vaunted as a, a, a negative ad maker, is they're, 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 I think, relatively predictable kinds of narratives, basically. The imagery is not that exciting, um, not that funny. It's just basically a bar brawl. It's a you know one big whack right to the jaw, and 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 not subtle. Uh, in your article, you also I, I was very interested because McCarthy's kind of just a normal guy. He, he didn't he doesn't seem to have you know. Tell us a little bit more about him. Well, yeah. I mean, I was expecting you never know what you're going to find when you start to do a profile of someone, and I was expecting kind of Doctor Evil and 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 it's a, a hater and somebody who just reveled in anger. And people kept telling me, I'd call them up and I'd say, so what's he like? And they'd say, oh, he's just a great guy. He's so funny and, you know, really delightful company you'd never know. And I said, but he's making millions, right? Does he live, you know, I was waiting to hear that he lived like a, you know, Pasha someplace. No, he lives in the suburbs and, you know, he's kind of a nice family. He actually likes to, you know, uh, coach his girls in soccer and stuff like that. I mean, it was really, um, you know, <laughs> not, not sort of ordered up the way one might expect, um, but it was more interesting that way, in a way, you know, I mean, and the, the point of being a reporter is, is to try to figure out what the truth is and not make it up in advance. So, I mean, it was interesting because it, it really, what came across to me was that he was somebody for whom the ends um, justified any means, and he, it's not a moral issue for him to hit really hard and sometimes quite below the belt. And one of the ads that you showed actually today is false. Um, it, it has a fact in there saying that Gingrich funded um, it, it, the brutal, China's brutal one-child policy. And um, he didn't. And that was just completely inaccurate. Um, and um, there's sort of no penalty, especially right now. I mean, and the other thing that I learned about Larry McCarthy was he has made a career specifically of doing ads not for campaign it's not right for the candidate, but for these, these outside independent expenditure groups. And they are inevitably the dirtiest ads, because the candidate doesn't have to say, I paid for this and I approved this. It doesn't speak, candidate doesn't speak in his own voice. Someone's out there who's not accountable, and they tend to just, for that reason, be um, unaccountable and not held responsible. I was going to ask Grants about that. The, because of the explosion in Super PAC ads, this year, do we see a different kind of characteristic or qual quality to those ads this year than we'd seen before when, before they didn't exist? Can you, can you kind of draw a distinction between what a candidate will do and what his supposedly uncoordinated uh, committees or committees in the case of most of these candidates have. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. The, um, the super PAC ads tend to be much more negative um, than the ones coming from the candidates themselves. And it winds up being very convenient for the, for the candidate because then he can be out there, for example, Mitt Romney, you know, with a sort of positive, generic message about um, his uh, presidential qualities and introducing himself as a personality. And then meanwhile, there's the super PAC that's just hammering Newt Gingrich, for example, in Iowa. And that I think really, um, certainly damaged him there, and that uh, Gingrich just didn't fight back about, uh, against very much in Iowa. And it took him until South Carolina to really have his own super PAC fighting back. And then it made a difference. And absolutely made a difference for him, too. Um, and, but it is sort of interesting, because the super PACs in some way, I mean, if Gingrich just had to rely on his own, um, his own fundraising abilities, I don't think he would have lasted as long as he had, as he has. And so the super PACs have in some ways equalized the field for some of these more minor candidates also. I think they've um. definitely extended the race and fight. But I would take, uh, you know, Ken, you were talking about um, how it's not a worry so long as there's equal money. And um, the thing is, we tend to, as 
to focus on the presidential race, um, where there does tend to be equal money, or at least enough on both sides, so that they can bury each other alive. Um, but um, I think, in, and you, you're, you're more of an expert on this than I am, but it's, I went down to North Carolina earlier to do a, a piece that was about what happened in 2010. And um, I think after Citizens United, we're beginning to see unequal money, particularly in smaller races, where you can really see um, people defined by secret groups um, who are putting up negative ads that are sort of hiding behind organizations where you can't really identify who they are. And they, they sometimes in local races, there's really not um, inequality in money. What do you, th I mean, at least that's what it looked like to me. What are you saying? Yeah, no, I disagree. I mean, I think if you look at um, 2010, the top 10 Senate races, um, actually a little pretty picture that showed this, is, you know, if you do the 50% bar, there's almost even advertising on each side, in each of the top ones. Wisconsin was one exception. Feingold didn't want or permit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. outside groups to come in on his behalf. But there's a couple where the Democrats have a little advantage. There's a couple where the Republicans have a little advantage, but nothing particularly significant. And then when you look at the, all the top House races, and what was obviously interesting about 2010 is you know, we're usually talking about 20 or 30 competitive races, and we suddenly had 100 races in play. <clears throat> the, the, the Democratic candidates, and the Democratic Party outspent Republicans, but the Republican groups evened that out. So when you looked at it overall, it was pretty even in terms of television advertising spending in those places. Now, that's only television advertising. There's obviously other sorts of spending that goes on in the campaign. Um, and there's certainly some districts where there was a little bit of an imbalance. But overall, um, Republicans maybe outspent Democrats by a very slight amount in House races in 2010. I think what's interesting watching the original ads from Eisenhower is, uh, of course, the rhetoric's the same. Uh, in so many cases, watching the uh, more recent ones, Bob, have you seen anything this year that really represents a distinctive leap forward in you know, overall nastiness, that's an official term, by the way, overall nastiness, um, technical, very technical term. Uh, so far this year, or are we really just in the same glide path of just, you know? No, I mean, I, and if this is anecdotal, uh, not, it's not, not a scientific, it's what Ken has done, but I don't think so. I mean, I think that uh, certainly it's, uh, we haven't seen uh, anything uh, revolutionary in the sense of the kind of create, creative sort of <coughs> negative attacks that, uh, that Sid and his colleagues Created, and I think I think I think you you said it. Uh, you may have said it earlier. I think that the the, the real problem with political advertising is how uh, unimaginative and how formulaic it is. I mean, these guys and and women who produce these spots, they they often are working for a dozen or more clients, and you look, you go from state to state to state, and you see the same spot over and over and over again with just a, just just different names, different people in them. And I, I think political advertising is, is sort of ready for another re revolution of creativity. I think that it's very much in, in, in need of it. And with the, you know, the, the fractured media environment, I mean, look, so, so Daisy Girl aired one time. They spent $25,000 on the spot. They got 50 million people to watch it. The, the three television networks aired it later that week. So probably by the end of the week, 100 million people saw that spot for a very small amount of I mean, incredible market penetration. Um, and, you know, now it's very hard to do that, and I think that, that, that advertisers, instead of, of running at one time, they run it 20 times. They, they buy 1,500 gross rating points a week, and they, 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 they just drill it into your consciousness. Right. And uh, I think there's a, there's a chance to, to, do, to do advertising that actually captures people's imagination. And I think a lot of what we see now is, is, is just very boring <coughs> and formulaic. Oh, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think two things. I mean, American elections are always going to be formulaic because you're either for change or you're against change. That's, I mean, you can have all the creative wizardry you want, but that's really what the essential choice is. But I think you make a really crucial point that, you know, criticizing my own career, I made a career out of counting bombs, right? The number of ads that were aired and how many gross ratings points. Um, the quality of the ad really matters. And especially now when there's so much advertising, having a signal that gets through that noise makes that creative stuff even more important. So, you know, we showed a couple ads from, from this cycle. Um, you know, people can think what they thought was the most effective one. But I think what we're going to see in this cycle are things like the, I mean, 
NBC will be angry if I call it the Tom Brokaw ad. But it was, um, and I think we're going to see more ads like that or more ads of candidates speaking in their own words. Uh, not as so much the you know, creative wizardry or cool graphics or those sorts of things, but what we saw in the Virginia race six years ago, the Makaka moment. There is, and we have all these cameras here, right? But there is not a single, you know, as, as short a time ago as 2000, presidential candidates were doing events which were not recorded, which there was no video there. There is now no House candidate, Senate candidate, presidential candidate who is doing an event no matter how small, which is not being recorded by someone, whether it be on their iPhone or something else. And I think we're going to start to see those things come into our advertising. I, I, I interviewed someone who was a, a younger Republican ad maker who said it used to be kind of against the rules to, go, to directly have the candidate attack his opponent by name and face on the, in the ad. But they're getting much more using each other's words directly, I think, and confrontationally. And also, one, two thing, two, there were two instances I came across where they not only have trackers who were following the candidate, but there were two ambush um, interviews where um, the opposition did an ambush interview of the candidate they were trying to hurt. Um, showing up with a video camera, sticking at the guy's face, and just asking a question that the candidate hadn't thought about at all, and then using it. Um, and, and that is, you know, it's getting to be like candid camera, only in a very much more negative sense, uh, I think. I was going to also say, we've, we've talked a lot about how uh, these ads are directed at other people, but it's also true that we've seen in this cycle grunts that some ads, negative ads, positive ads, can backfire on even the person who sponsors them. And there's the famous, now famous, uh, Rick Perry ad where he's walking across a field and talking about his views on social issues and that turned out to be a uh, sort of, um, he heard himself with that ad and I think you wrote about that briefly. Uh, yes, and in this ad, uh, you know, you're talking about the, um, the uh, what he was accusing, the war on religion um, and it was directed towards Iowa conservatives but I think because of social media now and the way that there's no way to uh, restrict local ads to local audiences anymore. Um, it, ob it immediately went viral the moment he put it on YouTube, and then it became a subject for mockery. People were doing all these response videos. There was a Tumblr. People did these gifts and, you know, put him in these funny situations. It became this whole thing online. And so um, I think the Internet is this, is this very um, sort of chaotic forum where anybody who doesn't like something can find a clever way to mock it. Um, and if enough people do that, it really winds up becoming a thing unto itself, a collective response to... Uh, an advertisement that really undermines the message and um, and creates a counter narrative nationally, so that Perry was trying to speak to Iowa conservatives, but he wound up having a message that resonated quite poorly with a national audience. And I'll make a point about that. That's that's a great example, and another good example of that is the the, the spot that Pete Hoekstra ran in, in Michigan against yeah. Debbie Stabenow, and that spot. Pretty, pretty negative, racist, if you want, uh, if you will. But uh, the the response to it was 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 so furious that it's 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 probably it may it may end up destroying the man's campaign, and I think that that's that's a good argument for letting the market sort of regulate itself. If for, all, for everybody who's concerned about it, I tell my students who ask, you know, how do you know when you, when you've gone too far, and well, you'll know. <laughs> you, they'll let you know. And I would say the, um, the sort of long infomercial against uh, Mitt Romney's uh, time, the King of Bane uh, infomercial that was picked up by the Pro Gingrich uh, Super PAC as well, um, really, I think, did not have its intended um, effect. It a kind of a boomerang. Yeah, it boomeranged, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he, it was just, people picked it apart immediately, they, you know, tracked on the people in the ad, they asked them how they were interviewed, uh, the people in the ad, you know, stepped away from it and said, this is not what we meant to be talking about, we were not even trying to talk about him and this thing, you know, Bain was good for us, and, and so, um, because of uh, social media and how easy it is to find everybody nowadays as well. well I do you think these ads are being picked apart uh, much faster, examined much more thoroughly than they were even four years ago? Um, usually there's the ad that hits and then you can almost have a predictable reaction period uh, to where it's literally sort of post-vetted. That couldn't have happened before. No, there was no, there was no, I think YouTube has revolutionized that for sure. Uh, it's interesting, the, the, the little girl who was in the Daisy Girl spot, Monique uh, Louise, uh, now 50 years old, she didn't actually see the spot that she was in, in until the year 2000. 
uh, you know, can you imagine uh, today? You know, you, she she did she never saw herself in the spot, and and it's YouTube is, has just revolutionized the ability to, to to disseminate this. What what would the audience have been for Daisy Girl if YouTube had been around? Well, I was thinking about Daisy, but then uh, Jane wrote in her story about Ashley, yeah. uh, which was an ad that came I think in two thousand four uh, by the Bush campaign against. I guess it would have been Carrie. Carrie John right. Carrie. Mm -hmm. Just talk a little bit about that and, and answer this question. Was that a negative ad? Well, it's been debated both ways. I mean, the, 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 the Larry McCarthy again made that ad, and it, he considered it a positive ad. It's a, it's very. He's very good at, at finding the emotional storyline and distilling it into sort of 30 seconds. And this was an ad that showed a girl whose, I think, mother had been killed in 9-11, and, and, and Bush... Um, and she met on a, you know, like a rope line or something. And he, he, he was just wonderful in kind of putting his arms around her and telling her that, um, you know, how hard it must have been and how sorry he was and how much he would do to protect her. And um, and then she speaks, and I think her father speaks. And it, it is a, it is a, you know, it's an ad that really sort of goes right for the heart in one sense, but it, the negative part is that it also creates a sense of fear. It, it plays on 9-11, and, and, and basically, it, it, according to the way it's been described, it had a huge effect in delivering Ohio, where Ashley lived, to Bush, and Ohio was a very important swing state for the election. So Bob Schrum claims that that ad you know, made the difference in the election, and he sees it as a negative thing that played reprehensibly on 9-11. You know, so it's been debated both ways. It's a, it's a, it's hope or fear. Uh, hope or fear. I, you know, it, it's somewhat in the eyes of the beholder, I think. Um, so, it, it, you know, but it's, it's an, it's I, that it, that I thought that one was one that that um, was more memorable than what we're seeing right now. McCarthy said he was the proudest of that one, which was an interesting yeah. comment. I mean, I mean that, that, there's an interesting story behind that. So I was working on a project with um, a friend of mine, Craig Gilbert, who works for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and. That ad was actually made as a fundraising tool, so it was not a Bush campaign ad. It was actually an ad by a group, and they were using it to raise money. And then it raised a lot of money, and they're like, "Wow, this is a this is a very powerful ad." Um, and I, you know, and I think it is a, a powerful ad. But we also have to be really careful of of over ascribing the effect of these ads. There was this one magic bullet that won the that won the election. So, you know, the Daisy ad, fantastic. Did not win the 1964 election. You know, the Willie Horton ad, powerful, did not lose the 1988 election for uh, for Mike Dukakis. Um, in 2000 and 2004, um, you know, was it that one Swift Boat ad or the one Ashley ad that 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 beat uh, that beat John Kerry. No, it's, it's, you know, and I think if you, you, you talk to the people who, who run campaigns, you know, they're working at the margin uh, now. When you win a presidential election by 537 votes in Florida, the margin matters in American politics. But um, I don't think it's, you know, these wizards sitting around a holiday in focus group and they find that perfect message to work, and then you air that message and put a bunch of money behind it, and it automatically wins you the election. Has anyone seen any evidence that this is now trickling down below federal races? I, I was just looking around uh, at news sites over the last couple of months through the last November. They had some statewide, citywide uh, elections around the country, and you, you begin to see negative advertising appearing in city council races uh, in places like Austin, Atlanta, Baltimore, uh, Seattle. Um, have you? Is anyone studying? Uh, the presence of those as this goes to the local level? So we definitely noticed in, in tracking the lower level ones that there was a lot of negativity. This is a, I'm a, I'm a too old professor, but this is a terrific project for um, a graduate student or someone to write a dissertation on, which looks at mayoral races, city council races, both what the tone is and the topic is and whether other sorts of strategies have, have percolated, percolated down. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because before, if you had to rely on television to put an ad on, it, it's, it's an inefficient use of money to have to buy an ad that reaches a whole station area. But if you can now do something cheaply on YouTube or on, on the internet, you could do a local cable. race. Cable, whatever. I mean, there are a lot more cheap ways to communicate the negative now. And so that goes to another point also about we were, um, you know, the target for a lot of these ads are 
you guys, the press. Uh, and you know, it was always the case that campaigns would air an ad maybe once or twice and then try and get the press to write a bunch of articles on it. Swift Boat's a great one. Daisy Boat, Daisy's the greatest example of that, right? Aired once and it's probably the most memorable ad air, ever. But um, the, f the first Swift Boat ad that was aired, aired a couple hundred times in very small media markets in Ohio and West Virginia, was very much not a national buy and then got huge attention from the free media. And that's why Kerry didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to give it a bigger audience. Right. Yeah. And I think actually the could control it. Right. But, but and I think the Bush campaign, I mean, you know, the Bush campaign at the time was as equally scared of that ad. I mean, they didn't want to be talking about Vietnam War records. Um, was equally scared at at the time, and then it turned out to you know very you know. Well, I, I heard you to caucus about the Willie Horton thing, and it was the same thing with with John Kerry. Neither of them responded. They both thought that they didn't have to. And Dukakis, all these years later, he's still he's just beating up on himself about how, oh my God, the biggest mistake I ever made was not responding to that ad. You know, I mean, and, um, that was a very famous non-response at the debate. Then, you know, if your wife was raped and murdered, would you support the death penalty? Well, and no. That, empirical evidence shows. Right, and so that I mean, and the other thing that when you talk to experts about the ads, they'll say, and I think Tony Schwartz, who was sort of one of the original geniuses of political ads said is he talked about how it, it has to play into a, what he called a responsive chord. Basic, at least that's, th this is the argument, and I haven't you know, looked into every ad, but it, 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 with the thing about the Willie Horton ad is it resonated with a narrative about Dukakis as a wuss on crime and you know, liberal. And it wasn't actually in a very important subject in the race, but it just it, it resonated with voters and undercut them. And I don't know if you can do a negative ad, and I'd be curious, about someone that completely redefines them and get away with it. Maybe, maybe in some ways that's what the John Kerry ad did because he was considered a, a hero in Vietnam and, and it turned him into a, 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 a war criminal in Vietnam or something. He simply chose not to respond in the same way that the Dukakis has, which I think had its own resonance. We've kind of been operating under the sort of unspoken assumption that negative ads are bad. Um, uh, I, I, I want to just challenge that for a little while here. Uh, I'm not acting under that okay, assumption. Uh, no. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's very good for all the business that we're in here. But I, I, someone wrote in after the uh, 2008 campaign about uh, negative ads, he, he wrote, what would we glean about current candidates from watching only their positive ads? That Mitt Romney loves his photogenic family? That John McCain is a common sense conservative? That Mike Huckabe Huckabee is unabashedly in favor of Christmas? that Rudy Giuliani will kill terrorists with his bare hands, or that Barack Obama's serene wisdom would make Gandhi look like Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> What's wrong with them? I, they work. That, as I interviewed someone in 1982, I asked him, why so many negative ads? 1982, he says, because they work. Is there any reason why they just aren't a useful information device for voters? Well, I think sometimes they are actually quite useful. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, obviously there was the one thing that was inaccurate in the super PAC ads um, against Gingrich um, from, uh, from Romney. But, uh, you know, I felt otherwise they were probably giving people useful information that they, they needed to have about some parts of his background. Um, the, it seems to me the test for all these ads is, are they true? And is it important? Well, I mean, they're... Uh, th there, there's true and there's true. You know, there's um, you know, who was it? Uh, tw Mark Twain talked about lies, damn lies, and statistics. And there's a whole other category which I think is political ads, which are <laughs> kind of lies that where something is what Mike Murphy described as pejoratively true. Yes, it's true, but it's totally taken out of context. So without the context, it's very misleading. And and so you know, Dukakis. Yes, they he was he that furlough program took place when he was governor, but it was invented by his Republican predecessor, and 45 states had the same program. So was that cogent as an argument against him? Is that really fair? You know, I mean, it, 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 without the context, it's very misleading, and I think that's what a lot of these ads are. I, I, I suppose, you know, I think some of them have great information, too. I'm not against them categorically. I, I, I think that they tend on mass to maybe make the whole product category look pretty sorted, which is politics. But the dirty little secret <coughs> political consultants, media consultants, I think, will tell you, if you give, give them a couple of beers, in them that, the, that, the, that they tell a lot, that a lot more lies are told in positive ads than negative ads. That's, I mean, you can't, you can't, I'm a family man. I love my country. I love, love puppies. I love Christmas. I mean, those are, those are not sort of demonstrable 
uh, statements that can be that can be checked, and, and uh, unless you can, you know, find someone, uh, you know, torturing Santa Claus or something, you're not going to be able to disprove that. It's it, the, the 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 facts are presented in these negative ads, and occasionally, you know, maybe maybe more often than not, you have people like John Kerry and Michael Dukakis who are incompetent when it comes to knowing how to respond in, in an effective way, but there are, there, there are many candidates out there who are very effective in, in responding to those and, and, and using, marshalling the, the, the media and others to set the record straight. And that's, that's why I agree with, with Ken that the, the negative ads are not a bad thing. They're a good thing. They engage people in a way that positive ads, frankly, I don't think do. Again, I don't think any of us up here are being Pollyannish. Are there serious problems in America? Yes. Are there, is there a lack of incentives for our political leaders to pay attention to long-term problems? Sure. Are statements taken out of context in political ads? Yeah. Are statements taken out of context in speeches? Are take, statements taken out of context in, in, in news reports? Are statements taken out of context 100 years ago in yellow journalism? Absolutely. And you know, I think the key thing is, and you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and with a mother in democratic politics in, Massachusetts, but I think we can pick on Massachusetts Democratic politicians. Our system at some point demands someone responding. Dukakis had the money to respond, had the chance to respond, decided not to. Professional decision. John Kerry had the money, had the resources, had the access to the press to respond. They decided not to. Again, there are plenty of ads that I think personally are awful, that I think are clearly in, inaccurate, but I don't think it's, it's my job, and I don't even think it's you know, your job as journalists to say, okay, I bless that ad, I don't, I don't bless that ad. And yeah, sometimes the market doesn't work, let's, let's, let's be honest, but there's a lot of reporters out there, there's a lot of money out there, and I think it's hard to say that sides aren't getting their say. You know, we're talking about something I think uh, Michael, it's also important to remember that we're, we're a lot of what I mean, everything we're talking about are are messages that are broadcast to a to a large audience. I mean, they're they're, they're clearly targeted to, to an audience, but I mean, it's not like that most people, if you're flipping around the channel, are going to encounter these 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 negative ads, these positive ads, and these these just these advertisements. The the dark corner of political advertising is direct mail. And is what I think is coming down the pike in this nano targeting, uh, you know, Google uh, long tail nano targeting, and look at look what look what Al Franken did in Minnesota. I think it was 140 distinct messages to 140 distinct groups that they sliced and diced the electorate, so that the the messages are going to one message is going to your neighbor, another message is going to you, and you may not know about that. And 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 mail, I think, is the most nefarious way to do it. It can come late. It, it comes so late in cases that you, there's no way you can respond to it, and it, it does its damage before the candidate who is the target of that, of that negative attack even knows about it. We need to schedule a, uh, uh, another session on Google long tail targeting before the end of the year. I can already, I can feel that's a great idea. Uh, in the last, before we turn to questions, I just want to talk a little bit about going forward in the campaign year, which is, uh, this isn't going to get much different. In the last few days, I just note that the Romney Super PAC has uh, gone up in Michigan with uh, nearly $2 million worth of ads aimed at Santorum. Uh, Santorum's three, four super PACs have come back and uh, answered that with al almost half that amount. Uh, Ron Paul has kicked in another million dollars. Uh, and um, I think in the last couple of days, Barack Obama's campaign has actually spent a quarter million dollars in Michigan attacking mm -hmm. Romney. So. Um, would someone like to sort of uh, sketch out uh, where the next four or five months are going in terms of how much money, I'm looking at Ken, uh, <laughs> might be spent? Uh, 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 just take us through, say, August. Yeah, you know in the, the Austin Powers movie when he sort of goes back in time, is, you know, if you don't give me $10,000, I will blow up the world. <laughs> I sort of feel like that's what the conversation we're having is now. We're going to see $2.5 billion dollars conservatively, could be as high as $3 billion spent on spot local television. Presidential? Or no, that's, everything. that's sort of soup to nuts. Dog catcher to president of the United States. The dog catcher is actually not an elected office anywhere. What, what, can you just hazard, I mean, we won't hold you to this, but hazard a guess of how much of that will be positive and how much will be negative, given current trends. 
Well, I think that th I think that's interesting. I think the I think the Obama campaign people have people have written about this will be very much like the 2004 Bush campaign. I think the Obama campaign will be overwhelmingly overwhelmingly trying to define whoever the Republican is. I think the Republicans going to have a choice whether they want to talk about themselves or whether they want to uh, whether they think they need to uh, go after Obama more. I mean, one of the things which we saw in 2004 is the Kerry campaign actually didn't air any negative ads. The Democratic groups, and people sort of forget that groups also existed before three weeks ago, right? So Media Fund and Move On, um, you know, big $20 million gifts given by George Soros and, and Peter Lewis. Those ads were overwhelmingly negative on George, uh, on George W. Bush. And I think if you talk to people in the Kerry campaign, they would say, you know, we might have been better off if our allies actually would have been more building us up than going after an incumbent president. Why is that the case? Because attitudes are pretty well formed about, attitudes were pretty well formed about George W. Bush. Attitudes are pretty well formed about Barack Obama. There's people who like Barack Obama, they're gonna vote for him. There's people who dislike Barack Obama, they're not gonna vote for him. There's a very swin, thin swath of, of undecided undecided voters and their attitudes towards Barack Obama are probably out of the control of advertising what's what's going on with the economy what's going on in the world and at the margin how those people can be influenced I mean we all pay attention to this stuff there's still people who are going to decide the presidential election in November of 2012 who absolutely haven't tuned in and I always give the example of the Super Bowl not as an advertising example but there's you know People only watch the Super Bowl. If you're someone who watches every game of the NFL season, you've got a favorite team. Okay, so if you're someone who's watching everything that's going on in the primary now and paying attention and going on websites and going on MSNBC and going on Fox and listening to Rachel Maddow and listening to Rush Limbaugh, you're not an undecided voter. You like one of the sides. At some point, this election is going to be decided by people like my wife in the Super Bowl. I got to be careful, my wife's very sophisticated in politics, but she only watches the Super Bowl. At some point, this election is going to be decided by people who only vote in presidential elections and are only going to tune into that presidential election two weeks out. I, I don't know. I just I, I think because of Citizens United, there and and the ability of corporate money to flow into these outside groups, you're looking at so much more money. I mean, how much money has there been so far in this election? Well, it's hard to tell because you, it's very, you can't really see what's going into the, the, the certain kinds of groups that, you know, the 501c4s. Um, and so it's, it, it's hard to chart. But um, I, but I wrote case, a piece. Though, most of the money in there now has been, you know, it's I been Shell Adelson, it's been these big, it's been these big givers. And a lot of that could be have been privately, done before. I think a lot of it's going to be privately held corporations because I think publicly held ones have to deal with um, issues of stockholders and, and, and a lot of public attention. But I think you see people like the people I wrote about, the Koch brothers. Um, they have a privately held company that does a $100 billion worth of business and they have a strong political agenda and the ability to use as much of that as they want. Um, I think it could make an actual difference in a race. Um, I, you know, we haven't really seen how it's going to play out, but I think the outside groups are going to be what I'm going to be watching because I think that's maybe what the amount of money they have to play with is more than before. Clearly, clearly the story is outside groups. The question is, are the Koch brothers going to spend more than they would have? Because it's not like they don't have a lot of money personally also. Or whether there will be other people who get in as a result of the easier... This well, is a lot right. going to be a lot easier to do this time it's around. It's more organized this time. Yeah. 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 Narratively, though, I think we're kind of already seeing the contours of the general election while the GOP primary campaign is continuing. And I mean, my colleague wrote a story, Molly Ball wrote a story about whether or not um, Romney has been pre-destroyed almost right. at this point um, by um, the sort of democratic effort to define him, which has been picked up, you know. Um, very vigorously by his Republican opponents. I mean, I have seen things that were, you know, written on TPN one day and were turned into a Gingrich anti-Romney ad the next day. And I mean, it just, it's kind of amazing to watch how much of the Democratic anti-Romney message is being picked up by his um, Republican opponents at this really point. We haven't seen the anti-Obama message yet. I, I think Not this possible. is all this sort of, you know, pre-game. Um, <laughs> I think it, the real thing in the general election is going to be amazing, I think. I'm very, I think, negative. I read somewhere that uh, the president has 50 opposition researchers already working for him in Chicago, and I'm guessing it's not 
because they're, those 50 people are going to be going door to door. Okay, uh, we're going to do some questions now. Uh, we have 10 or 15 minutes, so I'll start in the back. Yes, sir, in the black. Yes, sir. Yes. Please uh, wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Jim Snyder, a former American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow in Communications Policy, and also um, uh, 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 one of uh, former colleagues, Robert, maybe also Ken, uh, Tim Cook, was uh, one of my uh, dissertation advisors in political yeah. communications. He was also a communications policy yeah. uh, fellow in, in, in Congress. So uh, one, a comment, just a, a caveat on, on uh, this about 500,000 uh, elected positions in the United States. The presidential election is, you know, clearly the most important, but it's still only one. And it often happens that uh, local and state politics are qualitatively different uh, than federal elections. It's not just a matter of sort of trickle down, you know, what, w what works in terms of analysis at the national level applies at a local level. It's often very differ different. And unfortunately, as an academic who wants to go work at a major university or speak at a major think tank like this, you've got to focus on presidential elections, and that's what you study. And it's unfortunate, because sometimes I think uh, we have to be very cautious about the inferences that we make uh, from the, studying this one type of election. But my question relates to something uh, different, and that is, in order to get uh, these ads on the airwaves, you have to go through a gateway, which is your local TV broadcaster. And I have never seen, I haven't followed literature in, in more than a decade, a study about how broadcasters exercise their discretion and possibly abuse their power. Uh, they have inside information as to when these ads are going to run. And many of the marketing directors at these local TV stations work for politicians on their campaigns, give them advice. Uh, you know, getting heads up on negative campaigns is a big issue. One of the, the commentators mentioned, well, you know, both sides can do this as fair. Well, not necessarily. The broadcasters do exercise discretion. The issue arises most uh, when they have a direct economic ownership interest uh, on an issue. Uh, there are lots of anecdotes in the literature about broadcasters exercising this discretion, but I've seen no academic study. So the question is, uh, do you feel uh, that uh, the, the, the gateway to, to, to getting on the air, th those, th th the, the local broadcasters are significant players in any way in shaping uh, what happens. I don't think it happens at a presidential election, but I do think at a local level they have a lot of discretion over what Thank they carry you. and don't carry. Thank you. Anyone have a view? Well, they certainly have. The third party uh, ads, are, are, they're, they're not entitled to say everything, anything they want. The, 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 the broadcasters have more uh, have more control over what they air and what they don't. And I think in some cases, th those broadcasters you know, ought to exercise their, their right to insist that this, this be accurate. A lot of times it, 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 it takes a lawsuit by the candidate forcing the, the station to do that. But, and, I, and I think most stations don't want to get into the business of, of playing uh, umpire, but they have that right. Yes, sir, in the blue shirt. Hi, I'm Mark Nadell. I'm just independent. Um, the message I get from all of you is that negative is not up this year. I mean, overall, if you look back to 1800, whatever, it's been there. So that's kind of stable. My question is, what is going up? Is it spending per capita on advertising? Is it that negative ads are more misleading and that having super PACs advertise will lead to even greater percentage of misleading ads? Um, and lastly, um, uh, I think Ken mentioned that he didn't think his role was to uh, criticize, not criticize, when, when there are misleading ads out there that the, it's the voters to decide. Um, but I thought the press is supposed to go after misleading ads to correct things. Um, well, I'm not the press. Um, but no, I think that the, the press does discuss these, these ads, and I think they, I think they do. Um, I mean, if anything, the press probably discusses the ads too much. Um, it's, I mean, thank God it was my career, but it's like catnip for people in, in uh, you know, journalists getting the, uh, uh, getting the advertising, getting the advertising information. Um, what's different about this year? 
Uh, and I think this is a, actually will be a nice segue into the, into the discussion about why commercial advertisers tend to not go as negative. This is an unusually negative primary. And the reason why people tend to not go negative in a primary is not because it's a family, you know, family fights can sometimes be more, more brutal, right? It's because sometimes you'll have multi-person races. And so the, the 2004 uh, uh, Howard Dean, Richard Gephardt, it's famously called a murder-suicide in Iowa, where Dean went after Gephardt, <laughs> Gephardt went after Dean, and then uh, Carrie and Edwards were able to take one and two in Iowa. And I think actually, um, a, a bit of Santorum can be explained by Romney and Gingrich going after each other so heavily in Iowa, in, uh, there wasn't much advertising in New Hampshire actually, in Iowa, in South Carolina, in Florida. And what happens is, it's, you know, one of the reasons, and I'll, I'm, I'm making this up, I'll hear it from the people who really know what they're talking about, you know, one of the reasons why Burger King might not go after McDonald's is because if they go after McDonald's, well, it then benefits, it then benefits Wendy's. And in a general election where you only have two candidates, you don't worry about that. So there's no disincentive to going negative. So I do think there has been an unusually high level of negative advertising in this particular presidential primary. I think that's what's different. Um, and also the ability of, you know, I think you know, what Jane was saying, I mean, the, the groups are obviously a big deal. And it used to be you'd win a primary, and you'd get a little momentum, and then it would take you a week or two to raise some money to then go get on the air. Now, a win can be a $5 million check within 30 minutes. And then that can be wired right to the television stations. So also, the speed of which that momentum can happen and chain is different, I think. Speed is really a difference. You, know, uh, you were talking about how you can see something on a website one day and an ad the next day. The Willie Horton ad that you wrote about was surfaced by Al Gore, the information, months before mm -hmm. McCarthy actually ran it. That seems like almost in a, a quaint period of time now. Uh, third row. You it was in a Democrat debate. In a, yeah. And in a primary debate, yes, sir. Third row, yes. Uh, I'm Ed Levy, a freelance writer. Um, under Citizens United, uh, is there disclosure? How do we know if foreign entities are putting money into American politics? Great question. Uh, Great question. Want to know well, under Citizens United, is there disclosure? Um, it allows, there, there, the super PACs, it seems to me a lot of people are confused and think that there's no disclosure of, of who's giving you the super PACs. That money is disclosed, and you can figure out who it is, and that's why you know about Foster Fries and um, Adelson and people like that. Um, but there are, there are other categories that are on the margins, the, the 501c3s and 501c4s, and 501c4s you do not know where the money is coming from. And um, they're not supposed to be explicitly involved in electioneering. But um, the, the lines have just gotten so muddy. What, they, they were somewhat muddy before Citizens United, but what, I, what people tell me is that Citizens United was seen as a green light that basically told people with a lot of money that might want to give it secretly, don't worry, you're not going to be prosecuted. Um, before, it was kind of iffy legally, and a lot of people didn't want to take the risk. Now, no one's worrying about taking the risk. They're just throwing the money out there. That's at least how I read it. Yes, sir. The second, uh, third row back. Uh, Hi. Uh, Don Blauweiss, former uh, DDB creative, and uh, now with uh, senior creative people. Um, we were talking about the uh, history of, of negative advertising and we see how far back it's gone and that it continues and that it's not in many ways very different. However, due to Citizens United, isn't there much more of it along with the connectivity that we have today with, with the internet and everything else? Isn't, isn't there a much greater flood of, uh, of it so that while it may not be different in content, it's, it's different in, qu in quantity? You know, listen, I think one would have to, and I'm, you know, and I'm careful of, you know, speaking about things without, without the data, but, you know, I imagine if you went back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, one, you had a much more robust print journalism, some, you know, multiple newspapers in particular markets. Some of those markets, you know, and some of those newspapers were more um, directly partisan than we would be used to having newspapers now. So, you know, Fox News as a TV station or MSNBC as a news station, that was sort of the norm for many newspapers and how they, how they did coverage um, in this country. So, 
you know, is there more negative television advertising? You know, apps, you know, absolutely. Um, are there more negative things being said? I don't know. What was said at the bar before? What was said in speeches before? What was said in places of worship before? What was said in partisan newspapers before? What was said in newsletters before? What was said on the radio before? I don't know. I don't have the empirical evidence, but I guess I'd be suspicious that it was the good old, the good old days. Yeah, if the money just keeps going up and up, correct? I mean, they're, they're, you're talking about two and a half billion. What was it last time in, in 2008 on ads? It was nothing like two and a half billion. Yeah, right? I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that much less well, than that. Well, I mean, that. compared to inflation, it's, not, it's, it's one of the sectors of the economy that's booming, apparently, is political well, ads. And what you're seeing in the advertising is, I mean, the big effect of a lot of these campaign um, finance decisions, sort of the twin of... Of, uh, of McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, and then the Citizens United decision, is what it's really done is weakened parties. So if you look at the size of the pie, the size of the pie in terms of you know, spot advertising on television has not grown tremendously. Um, now, there's obviously the internet and there's other ways of, of, of communicating, but the slices of the pie are different, where the slice that the party controls has gotten much smaller. The slice that candidates control has stayed about the same, but the slice that these groups control is much bigger. So what sort of the, 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 the decision in McConnell versus FEC and then the Citizens United, together what they've really done is made it very difficult for parties to be major players and in terms you, of the message ad war. All right, and if you look at the groups, who's in the groups? Basically, the voice that's gotten amplified are the voice of the super wealthy, the, the, the people who can give a million dollars is a lot louder this time around than it's ever been before, or 10 million. We have time for one more. I'm going to go right here. About the, this one, yeah, there you go. Edward McBride with The Economist. Um, can you tell me about people who try and be positive? I mean, obviously, we've already discussed the example of Gingrich, you know, piously saying he wasn't going to do negative ads and getting hammered and then deciding actually negative ads were a great thing. But um, what about, uh, I don't know, in 2010, uh, Hickenlooper in Colorado, who did that spot of himself in the shower, which I'm sure some of you remember, you know, if you sort of trumpet yourself as, an, as being positive, does that, does that make any headway with voters? Is there any evidence on that? Obama's entire 2008 campaign was based on that. I mean, I mean, yes, there was the negative ads in the contest with McCain and arguing over the economy, but you know, without his positive message, I mean, the whole thing was based on the idea of hope and change. And it's been sort of interesting to watch the the very few videos that the Obama campaign has actually put out so far, where they're trying to figure out how to to continue that positive message um, and, and, and highlight his accomplishments as a, as a president and put that out there in an environment where you know, there's a lot of criticism of him. I, w I was struck by how, uh, how bad can the negative ads really be if uh, in a debate which we saw on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, um, Ron Paul simply looked at Rick Santorum and said, you're a fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's going to conclude. I want to thank Ken and Garant. And Bob and Jane, I want to thank you. I want to thank New America for having us. And uh, we'll do this again.